Um, we're going to be starting a new series today for the next uh, five weeks, and we're calling it Through the Valley, Through the Valley, and we're going to be looking at the six verses in Psalm 23. So this is the thing. Um, a lot of us um, grew up in a particular uh, uh, church culture, maybe, um, or mindset where, where you memorized the Lord's Prayer. Um, you've been to enough funerals where you, you, you've, uh, you've heard the Psalm 23, you can probably quote it by memory, you know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will, f- yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we've, you know, you can memorize things like that. You can memorize the Lord's Prayer and know it word for word and not know what it means. And, and so um, we're going to take Psalm 23. I believe that Psalm 23 literally um, is the cliff notes of the Bible for us today. I believe that everything you need to know about God and his character and his love for you and his plan and what, what life is going to be like, I believe that you can read it in there and go, wow, this is, this is my life. And so we're going to take some time and go through it. We are going to look at it from the perspective of the, 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 uh, the Passion Translation, which is a fairly new translation, but I love, I love the, uh, the uh, wording of it. And, and, and the more I've looked at it, uh, they've got, they're spot on when it comes to the original translations, really spot on with some things. So we'll get into that more as we go. But um, I just want to say, uh, we're, we're going to start off talking about the valley. I'm, I've entitled this message today, The Reality of the Valley. And that is this, that if you haven't gone through a valley yet in, in, the, in recent months, um, just to encourage you, you're, you're going to be going through something probably. Because we all do. That's part, of, that's part of life, right? You've either just gone through it or you're getting ready to go through it. It's just the way it is. But, but if, if I was going through a valley with no purpose, I would be really discouraged. But when I know that there's purpose in it, when I know that I am not alone going through it, I'll go through anything if I know Jesus is with me. Now bring it on. Let's go, Lord. As difficult as it might be, as long as you're with me, we will walk together. So the valley is a reality in, in, in all of our lives, but, but it's only temporary. Turn to someone and say it's only temporary. And, and I love the wording of it. It doesn't, it, you know, we are called to go through the valley. It doesn't say we're supposed to live there. It's not your zip code, pal. You don't have to stay there very long, but you have to go through it. And, and the one thing that I've learned in serving Jesus all these years is that the valley will make you or break you. I believe that valleys are put in our lives to transform us. I believe that there are some things that can only be learned while you are in a valley. And so we're going to just look at this. Let's, let's look at Psalm 23 in the Passion Translation. This is going to bless you. Seriously, this is going to seriously bless you. I know it. This is so good. Now that I've just talked it up, I hope it meets its expectations. So, the Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace, the quiet brook of bliss. Sounds like a Hallmark card, doesn't it? That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness, so that I can bring honor to his name. Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me, for you already have. You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely, for you are near. You become my delicious feast, even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. So why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. And then afterward, when my life is through, I will return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. How awesome is that, right? So if you're taking notes today, we're going to look at four things, four observations of these uh, first three verses here. Number one, I want you to write down through the eyes of a sheep. I think it's interesting that David 
was was old, an old man when he wrote this, but David David was a shepherd, remember? But David didn't write this from from the perspective of a shepherd. David wrote this from the perspective of a sheep. And I think that's very interesting uh, because the perspective of a shepherd would have would have changed this whole uh, these whole six verses. David um, in his life had seen tragedies and disappointments. He had seen victories. He had lived he had lived a good life. But but in spite of all of the valleys and all of the things that he went through, he had come to know God in a very powerful and personal way. David declared right out of the gate in verse 1 that the Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. What is he saying? He's saying that he was a sheep. And so I think one of the greatest leaders of Israel who was a shepherd um, couldn't really lead until he knew how to be led. You want ministry? You want God to promote you to the next season of your life? You cannot lead until you know how to be led. And that's, that's the great thing about uh, uh, being one of God's people is, is, is that we're all in the same boat. We, we need to understand that we are not in charge of this life as much as we think we are. <laughs> and, that, and we're reminded of that on a daily basis of how not in charge we are. <laughs> I just said that all wrong, but that's okay. You get the point. All it takes is a, is a stroke or something that you didn't expect to take place, and you realize how little control you actually have. Do you know that God calls His people, you and I, sheep over 200 times in Scripture? You're like, man, that's pretty cool. I don't think that's a compliment. Because sheep are kind of stupid. And <laughs> I'll speak for myself and for some of you, we're stupid. <laughs> I'll speak to myself. I mean, we, we make stupid things, st- stupid decisions. How many of you have ever said, oh, why did I say that? Why did I do that thing? Or here's a good one. I'll tell you what, I'm never going to do that again. I just made my point. I will now rest. How many have went to the circus? You ever been to the circus? Let me ask you this question. You've seen elephants, right? And tigers and other things, right? You've got to help me here because I don't know. Okay, good, good, good. So, so, how many have been to the circus and you've seen sheep performing tricks? You don't, because you can't tame a sheep. They're so stubborn, and they're so stupid. They run in flocks, and then they, 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 they just do their own thing. If you, if you brought a bunch of sheep into a circus, they'd be all over the place. They would, it would be chaos, much like you and me. And the problem is when we make stupid decisions like sheep, like the sheep that we are, then there comes regret, and then regret can literally paralyze us for today and tomorrow, and, and, and I love, I just want to just digress for just a minute in, in, in Philippians 3, what Paul says about moving forward, and he said, he said, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing. How many can relate to that first sentence? But, I'm, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose of that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. So let all who are fully mature have this same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to them. And let us all advance together to reach this victory prize following one path with one passion. There's a little verse in Scripture where uh, it says that Jesus was uh, looking at Jerusalem and he was weeping. And it, and it says in that verse that, that he looked at Jerusalem as, 
he looked at the people of Jerusalem as sheep without a shepherd. There's a book that was written several years ago, and I've used it all through the years whenever I've talked about this topic. And it, the book was called A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, and it was written by a, a, a sheep herder by the name of Philip Keller. And um, he owned a huge ranch and worked with, with uh, sheep for decades. And so he's a wonderful authority on this. And so I want to read to you some of the characteristics about sheep, okay? Um, and, and maybe you'll see some similarities <laughs> with sheep and yourself. I'm just saying. I'm, it's not me. It's just the, I'm reading something here. He said, he said that sheep uh, require more attention than any other livestock. They just can't take care of themselves. Unless their shepherd makes them move on, sheep will actually ruin a pasture, eating every blade of grass until finally a fertile pasture is nothing but barren soil. Sheep are nearsighted and very stubborn, but easily frightened. An entire flock can be stampeded by a jackrabbit. They have little means of defense. They're timid. They're feeble. Their only recourse is to run if no shepherd is there to protect them. They have no homing instincts where a dog or a horse or a cat or a bird can find its way home but when a sheep gets lost, it's a goner until someone finds it and rescues it. So there's some things I want to pull out of this that, that, that for me, represent you and I. Uh, number one, the, the thought I, uh, about sheep is that sheep cannot cleanse themselves. If you have a cat, which we will pray for you for, for true salvation, if you have a cat, because we all know that where cats come from. I'm just kidding. I'm, jo I'm joking. I love cats. I love cats. <sighs> but a cat can cleanse himself. He licks himself, and he gets himself all gussied up. He cleans himself. Dogs kind of do that, but dogs are, like, really crude, right? Dogs are just crude animals, man. I don't, it, cr dogs have no class, but I love dogs. Um, so, so there's animals that can cleanse himself, but, but a sheep cannot cleanse himself. And it reminds me of you and I, that you and I are unable to cleanse ourselves of this issue we have called sin. And we need something or someone external to, to cleanse us, and that would be the person of Jesus Christ, obviously. Another thought is that sheep cannot defend themselves. Many animals have a defense system. Even a blowfish has a, has a defense system or a skunk, but sheep do not have a defense system. Um, and, and it reminds me of how we are defenseless without Christ in our lives because the battle that we fight is not of flesh and blood. So in 2 Corinthians, Paul said this. He said, for although we live in the natural realm, which would be earth, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and breaks through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow down in obedience to the anointed one. We can't fight this fight ourselves because it's not flesh and blood. And, and Ephesians 6 talks about the principalities and the, the spiritual forces in high places. I mean, this is bigger than you and I. We need Jesus to fight this fight, so we're a lot like sheep. Uh, another thought is that sheep cannot find food or water for themselves. Did you know that? Um, that's why Jesus had to tell us, yo, guys, I am the bread of life. Every day, come to me, and you'll never be hungry. And believe in me, and you'll never be thirsty. Because um, we're a lot like sheep. So did you know that sheep will not drink water from a noisy or turbulent brook. Did you know that? It has to be peaceful. It has to be a quiet place for them to relax enough to drink. That's why I believe that David talked about still waters in, in Psalm 23, green pastures and still waters, because a sheep will not drink if there's chaos, if, if there's anything like that going on around them. And, you know, it, it, it reminds me of you and I. When our souls 
are crying out for something more, when, when we're hungry for something, when we're thirsty for something. Isn't it interesting that we never find it in the midst of the voices and the chaos and all of the circumstances around it, but it's only when we withdraw to a quiet place, when we withdraw to a, a, a place of prayer, that we really get our souls fed. Because like sheep, you and I need peacefulness and quietness to get our souls fed. Jesus went on to say, all you thirsty ones, come to me, come to me and drink. So, so this, is, you know, this is a really interesting thought. We are like sheep, and, and he wrote this for you and I because he wrote it from the perspective of a sheep. The second thought, if you're taking notes, I want you to write that he leads us from stress to rest. He leads us from stress to rest. In verse 2, it says, He offers a resting place for me in His luxurious love. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace, the quiet brook of bliss. It's not easy to get sheep to lie down and rest. Um, the strange thing about sheep is that they, re- they will refuse to lie down unless there's four requirements that are met. Number one, they must be free from all fear. Number two, there must be no tension with other sheep. Number three, they must not be aggravated, like with flies and parasites and stuff. And number four, they must be free from hunger. If these four requirements are met, then it's easier for the shepherd to get the sheep to lie down. And you and I are the same way. When God says, look, I just need you to chill out and receive from me, you and I refuse to do it sometimes. And the reality is is that God makes us lay down every so often. I'm going to mess with your theology, some of you, a little bit, but I believe that even sometimes God allows us to to deal with illness or loss or heartbreak just to get us to stop. He allows things so that that we have no other place to to turn but Him. We're, We're just like sheep in so many ways. Like sheep, we're easily freaked out, too. People panic over the most ridiculous things. We live an uncertain life. But this is the thing. Nothing quiets our souls like knowing our shepherd is near. Suddenly things aren't as bad or terrifying as what we thought they were because he is with us. 2 Timothy 1, it says, For God will not give you the spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. Number three, he restores my life. God is in the restoration business. In verse three, it says that's where he restores and revives my life. So I love the word restoration. I, I, I'm, I'm a big car fan. I love anything, though, uh, uh, I, I, I love anything uh, that where you take something old and dilapidated and, and make it brand new. I love that. My, I was sharing in the first service that when Kim and I got married, we were at her parents' house, and he hit, in his garage he had this, dr- this dresser. It's about this high, about this, about this big, and he had tools in it. And yeah, it, the, thing was, the thing was painted like ten different times, and I think it had been in their family for years. And I got looking at it, and I thought, man, I like the look of that thing. And he was going to throw it out. And I said, can I have it? And, and the first month we were home, I was in, we were newlyweds. I was out in the garage. I stripped that thing down, and I stained it, and I put tongue oil on it and rubbed it in. And, I, man, I, I, I think I spent about two weeks on it. We've had that crazy dresser um, in every home that we've lived in. And the other day, we were like, what are we going to do with that? And I said, we're keeping it. <laughs> I love that thing because I know the story of it. And it was something that could have ended up in a dumpster, and it's been, a, it's been in our home ever since. And, and, and that's the way God looks at you and I. He is in the restoration business of your life. So there's this term, an old English term, uh, about sheep, and it's called uh, a cast sheep, C-A-S-T. And, and, and what happens when a, sherp, when, a, when a sherp, if I could talk, it'd be wonderful. It, when a sheep is cast... Is that the, the, for some reason the sheep will lose its balance and fall over on its back? Do you know that a sheep cannot right himself on his own? And so what happens is if there's a physical process that takes place. The gases start building up in the sheep's stomach. The stomach gets hard. It starts to 
um, uh, close off the air supply, and the sheep will eventually suffocate. And, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, pretty quick thing that happens. And, you know, I got thinking about that, and I thought, well, I wonder if that's why when it talks about the shepherd in the Bible uh, leaving the 99 sheep, he's always looking over the flocks. I wonder if that's meaning that he's looking to see if any sheep are cast, if they're on their backs and unable to get up, and he'll leave the rest of them to go over and rescue that one. I wonder if that's what it was talking about. So the process is this. The sheep's on his back, losing the, the, the blood flow out of his legs. The shepherd will come, grab it very gently, and start to turn it over and start to massage the leg muscles and get the blood flowing again. And the sheep, you know, his equilibrium's off from being on his back. And, and the shepherd, this is exactly what happens. The shepherd will hold that sheep up until it starts to have a, a firm footing and can get his balance. And he will just talk very gentle to the sheep. So he keeps it calm. And, he, and, he, and when the sheep is ready and, and the sheep can make it on his own, then he'll let go and the sheep will go with the other sheep. I feel like you should say sheep and sheeps or something, but I'm all messed up with that. You know what I mean? But isn't that the way God works with us? Have you ever been in a place where you have found yourself on your back, and you are, you've just not been able to right the ship. You've not been able to get back on your feet for some reason, whether it's emotionally, mentally, financially, whatever. And, 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 and it's just like the shepherd. If you can have that picture in your mind that he's looking for you, and when you can't do it on your own, he will come up alongside of you and wrap his arms around you and start to get you on your feet. And when you're ready, he'll release you. I, I see it in Jesus, the way he treated people. People done the dumbest things, and they found themselves in the worst situations, and Jesus would just gently speak to them and, and, and help them get back on their feet. And he, he, he looks that way with you and I. Look at Peter. Remember when Peter denied Jesus? And, and he, by all means, he should have been left out of the club. His membership card turned in. Turn in your keys. You're no longer a disciple. That's what I would have done. Peter, you, you let me down, man, at the worst possible time. Goodbye. Jesus made him breakfast. He said, man, I love you. Peter, how much do you love me? And you know the conversation. Number four, you got to keep moving. And this is one of my favorite parts of this. It says in verse 3 that he opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. So this is where we are a lot like sheep. So sheep left to themselves, as we just read a few minutes ago, will not move forward. They will stay where they're at, where they're comfortable, and eat the ground until they eat the roots and everything, and it's just dirt. They destroy it. Sheep love change about as much as you and I love change. And it's amazing how God sometimes will force you to move forward from where you're at. He does it in the church, and he does it in your life. My wife and I are walking through something right now where we literally feel like God has been moving us forward. It's the strangest feeling and the strangest thing, and we, we kind of just feel like we haven't had a lot to do with it. Doors are closing here. Doors are opening up here. I'm not leaving. Don't, don't panic. I'm, I'm here. But I'm just saying. But, but there's times where you, if you're left to ourselves, you are so comfortable where you're at, you'll never pursue what's ahead. So what will God do? He'll, he'll, let you, he'll let you exhaust everything where you're at so that you no longer can survive there, and then he'll move you forward. But what I love about it, was that God doesn't move you forward just because it's time to go. Why? Because he sees a fresh place for you to eat and be refreshed, a new pasture. And so some of you that have been going through a tough season and a tough time, you're like, I don't get where, what God's doing has allowed me to be in this valley. You just need to chill a little bit and maybe understand that God is leading you through it to get you to a higher, better place where you can eat and feast. pretty cool. But we 
are a lot like sheep in the fact that we, we follow our own ideas and turn to our own ways. And, and Isaiah nailed it. He said, he said, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, and yet the Lord laid on him the sin of all of us. So when, when it's talking about, in verse 3, footsteps of righteousness, that's talking about direction, the right direction. You might be in a place where you're in, you might be in the right place at the wrong time. You might be at the wrong place at the right time. But, but this is talking about moving in the right direction, and God will always lead you and go before you. He will always keep you on the move because He knows what lies ahead for you. Do you know the greatest single safeguard that a shepherd has in protecting his sheep is to keep them moving? Because if they stay in one place too long, now they're vulnerable to attack. Oh, my God, that was so good. Thank you, Pastor Mike. That was awesome. That was life-changing. Oh, no problem. It was my pleasure. If you stay in one place too long, you'll be vulnerable for attack. Bless you. That sounded a little wet. I don't know who that was, but that sounded a little wet. Those of you around, you might want to get some paper towel. I'm not sure. Verse 3, it says that he opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. Isn't that the goal? And so what's cool about this is that word name in the Hebrew means reputation. It means fame. It means glory. The name of God represents the reputation of God. You can depend on him, and you can depend on what he says, and you can depend on what he's promised. So, for instance, we, my wife and I love watching those. We, we love watching like Antiques Roadshow and American Pickers and all the. We just like, we like the thought that, that you could find a treasure in a bunch of garbage, and you could be like a gazillionaire because you found it. Oh, look at this plastic thing. This is a Nestle's first edition. This is worth $5 million. Woo! Wouldn't you just love on one of those shows, like at Antiques Roadshow, where they go, oh, this is a rare thing. This is worth $10 million. You just see the person go, boom. I would just love to see that. No, I wouldn't. But it, Right? You would, right? Yeah, you would. Okay. Um, just, just right out of the camera frame. Boop. Uh, call 911. We got some. Okay. So. Ah, we just lost a bunch of families. I'm so sorry. But parking will be better next week. Um, so I'm just playing. I'm just playing. with. I'm teasing you. I am teasing you. Relax. We've got to have fun. So let me just th- throw your, see your knowledge here a little bit. So if you were in the market for a violin, what would be the most ultimate violin to have? You guys are firing on all cylinders today. What about a piano? Baldwin? Is that a good brand? Steinway. Yeah, there you go. And I could go on and on. I think one of the, 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 the greatest things was about six, seven years ago, Kim and I were speaking at a church in Southern California, and it was our, around the time of our anniversary, and um, uh, we get up on the morning of our anniversary, and Kim's like, so honey, we can do anything you want to do today. And of course, as a husband, I'm like, that is a total trick question. Even though she's saying that, she doesn't mean it. I know it. So I'm like, so what do you want to do? Right? Which would be the right answer. And she said, no, seriously, I'll do anything you want to do today. And I'm like, for real? Yeah. Yep. I said, okay. Seriously? Yep. So we were, um, we were um, about 20 minutes from this uh, place called Huntington Beach. And I'm a big car fan. I love, you know, Huntington Beach. Maybe I saw you there. I'm not sure. That's, that's awesome. So you'll know exactly what I'm about to say. So, um, you know, I'm a big car guy, and I love, like, all those shows. It's just crazy. I can just watch them when they take an old car and they redo it. So one of my favorite shows at that time was a show called Overhauling, and uh, some of you have heard it. And, I mean, I cry like a baby watching that show. I mean, you, the Hallmark Movie Channel is one thing. I hate that. But I can watch Overhauling and cry like a baby for someone that just got a brand-new Camaro. It just breaks me up. And, and, and so we were there, and I said, I said, you know what? I would love, if, if you're really serious about this, I would love to go see Chip Foose's shop where they do Overhauling. Guys, I thought that was a pretty good goal to shoot for. 
And she said, okay. And I'm like, really? So we went there. And so, but we didn't know that um, they do t- private tours at lunchtime. We didn't know that. We pulled up, and his executive assistant comes out, and she says, would you guys like a tour? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> 90 minutes we got to tour the back of Chip Foose's shop, and we got to see stuff that he was working on that I have since seen that he won SEMA awards for and all this stuff. So we were looking at these cars, and his doodling is on the fenders where this needs to be smoothed out, and I'm taking pictures. I mean, it was, it was just like the holy grail of hot rod building right there. You know what made it cool? I could have gone to any hot rod shop, but in my opinion, at that time, Foose was the standard bearer of really cool stuff. If you knew his name, if it was a Foose car, it was worth a lot of money. Well, I think what's so cool about God is that he is the ultimate name to have on anything. If God's fingerprint and his stamp is on it, then it represents his excellence. And, and, and so in, in Revelation, this is what God says about you and I. It says, and I will write my own name on you. You are a Stradivarius. He doesn't make junk. As our band comes, we're going to kind of wind this down a little bit. But you might be at a place in your life where you're, you're not sure what your tomorrow is going to hold. You're going through some rough waters. You're, you're a little stressed out about some things. Well, this is what I want you to take away from this message today, that, that, that God, as our shepherd, he knows where to go, which is direction for your life. He knows how to get there, which is the method that he's going to do it. You might not understand how, you, how it's going to be done. He does. He knows why you're going, which is the purpose of it. And he knows when to move, which is the timing of it. How many in this room today wouldn't just love to know the direction of your life, the method of how you're going to get there, the purpose of why you're going, and when it's going to happen? We all would. When you follow a shepherd like him, you can put your trust in the fact that he'll answer all four of those. And then, you know, when I, when I look back at, the, at Psalm 23 here and I see that David could write this in this perspective because David understood that, that, that God was beneath him in those green pastures. He was beside him in the still waters. He was before him at the table. He was behind him pursuing him with goodness and love. And he was beyond him preparing a home in heaven. David had been giving a whole lot more than he deserved. And, and you and I have been given a whole lot more than we deserve. Sorry. <laughs> I just well, had a disaster here. Take This week, just move that wall back another 10 feet. Will you do that for me? Okay. I want to close with a story about F- uh, Fiorella LaGuardia, which was the mayor of New York City back in the 30s. Um, true story. This was, it. this was in a local newspaper, so it's not anything we're embellishing. True story. And it speaks about when sometimes we get what we don't deserve and we don't get what we do deserve. The article says that one winter's night in 1935, Mayor LaGuardia, the mayor of New York, showed up at a night court in the poorest ward of the city. He dismissed the judge for the evening and took over the bench. That night, a tattered woman charged with stealing a loaf of bread was brought before him. She defended herself by saying, my daughter's husband has deserted her. She is sick and her children are starving. The storekeeper refused to drop the charges, saying, It's a bad neighborhood, Your Honor, and she's got to be punished to teach other people a lesson. LaGuardia sighed, and he turned to the old woman and said, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail, and he slammed the gavel down. However, even while pronouncing the sentence, LaGuardia was reaching into his pocket, taking out a ten dollar bill. He said, here's the $10 fine, and he threw it in his hat, and he says, I am now remitting the sentence. And furthermore, 
I am going to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a city where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. The next day in the New York paper, it said $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered old grandmother who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. Making forced donations were a red-faced storekeeper, 70 petty criminals, and a few New York policemen. Sometimes we get what we don't deserve. That old grandmother, by the letter of the law, deserved punishment, but she didn't get it. She deserved justice, but she got mercy. She deserved to stay in the city jail, but she got to go back home. She deserved to be around criminals like herself, but she found herself safe in the presence of her family.